this month, we're going to be checking in with some of Ireland's top athletes competing at the Paralympics. They are, of course, my teammates. I am joined now with para swimmer Nicole Turner. Nicole, hello. Hello, Ellen. How are you? <laughs> I am good. It's so interesting to uh, be interviewing you right now because we're both actually when away. you're in a room beside me. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's the thing. You might notice the background that our our um, walls are quite similar. So, Nicole, it's not that long now until the Paralympics. How are you feeling? Uh, to be honest, I'm pretty excited. Like it's been it's been a long time coming, but to actually think what it's in two weeks time. It's very, very exciting. The real, it's starting to feel real. And what are you looking forward to most about the games? Um, I think just actually getting out there and competing. Like looking back on Rio, I was the baby of the team, going around like I didn't really care. Whereas I think Tokyo will be a bit more serious, but serious in a good way. But then I'll still be able to enjoy myself as well. And how do you manage those nerves if they are, do you, do you get nervous when you, when you say it's going to be a little bit more serious, I kind of feel that pressure coming from you or some nerves coming from you. How do you manage that sort of um, expectation, I guess, leading into a competition? Uh, yeah, I would say it's a bit more nerves than it used to be. But I think for me, this is where me and you differ, Ellen. For me, when I get nervous, uh, I try to surround myself with a lot of people and just take my mind off them and then talk about any other stuff. Um, so I think just, and even now, just focusing on them and like all the work, all the hard work's done. Um, it's just about getting there and getting ourselves there safely and then actually stepping up and racing. And I think the key for me is to enjoy myself and not overthink it. And once I enjoy myself, I always bring out the best. I think that's such an important message because I know we are watching the Olympics and we are watching all of the Irish athletes do such amazing jobs, but some of them maybe didn't perform as they wanted to. And a lot of them were first time Olympians and the pressure of an event can actually get to people. And it is about just focusing on enjoying yourself because at the end of the day, you've worked so hard to get there. And I think that's the most important thing that maybe you learned from Rio because Rio you were only 14 you were a little baba um, and the reason you went is because you needed that experience so that by the time Tokyo came around you didn't get caught in the headlights you are ready to go um, tell me about Rio what what memory stands out the most from Rio uh, there's a few I'd say I mean the actual competing side of it Cause I even remember like all oh, you guys are getting nervous going all quiet into yourselves and I was like what's going on it's just a bit of a swimming <laughs> um so yeah I just think I really enjoyed it and then there was the highs of, of all being together as like and that was the thing about Rio as well because it was my first games it was my first time with the big majority of a team whereas times before that we'd only been away with swimming but the difference was we were away with all of these sports uh, and just the different sides of that and then carrying the flag I'd say was I mean it was probably more of a proud moment for mom and dad but <laughs> when I look back on it that will be the memory of Rio I'd say. You were saying about how you were just so calm and relaxed I remember in Rio I because I was 21 in Rio and you were 14 and I remember being so jealous of you just because you were so <laughs> cool and relaxed and I was like oh ignorance is bliss sometimes um, and I remember you had already raced on day one and I think I was racing on day two and you came up to me that the night before and we're like Hi, Ellen. I have um, a cereal bar. I thought you might want it because this is what I eat before a race. And I literally was like, oh my God, you're so pure. You're so sweet. Oh, thank you so much. Are you going to be bringing all those cereal bars with you to Tokyo? I mean, you're stuck with me as your roommate now, Ellen. So <laughs> um, I guess so. I guess I won't say no to any sort of food that's thrown at me. So. <laughs> Um, when it comes to packing for a games, how do you plan everything? How do you make sure that you have everything that you need getting on the plane to Tokyo? <laughs> I have to tell a dirty secret now and people are going to be like, what, Nicole? So the youngest member of Team Ireland is Roisin. 
And about three days before, three, four days before we came out, um, we were just talking to each other about what to bring. And she was like, oh, here, I made a list. So she sent me her list. <laughs> you are stealing the list <laughs> of the youngest person on the squad. Oh, my God. No. What happened to all that experience? Bro, she doesn't have as much experience um, as you do. I mean, yeah, it's just, it is very, and like even, it just was that little bit more stressful I can come in here because we were going away for training, but then we were also going away for competing. So even today I packed my, my, my suitcase to go to Tokyo. And normally when I leave for each I just push everything into the suitcase and give it to my mom to wash when I get home. But that's not the case this time. So for those of you who aren't aware, we're actually on a training camp in Fort Ventura at the moment. So we've been here for nearly two weeks and then we head off to Japan tomorrow. Um, and all of that in total is about five weeks away. So it does take a lot of preparation and planning to make sure that we have everything. What's your favorite snack to bring away with you, Nicole? Uh, it has to be jellies, I think. Like I could probably... I could probably live without everything, but like I think I'm the one person on the team that if, if you come and ask me for a jelly, I'll give you a jelly. <laughs> that is so true. Nicole always has a stash of jellies. I'm nearly surprised <laughs> that M and S nearly don't have all of their jellies stocked out I mean, because Nicole bought the shop. M and S Percy Pigs never fails. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll move on to the actual training aspect of it. So, Nicole, you are a sprinter. Um, when it comes to training, what what sort of different sets would you do compared to maybe a distance swimmer? Uh, so my sets are probably as nice as it sounds, shorter but faster. So like for the likes of Patrick on our team, he's a 400 swimmer. So he'd do more meters than me. And then when it comes to the fast, hard stuff, he'd do pace. Whereas I'd do less meters. And then when it comes to the fast stuff, so like as for this evening, the only thing I'm doing is a 50 fly for time. So <laughs> I get lucky in that sense that my training sessions, there, there's not, like there's a lot of mileage at the start of the season, but then as the season goes on, the mileage gets shorter and shorter. Now, Nicole says that uh, with a smile on her face, as if it is the easiest thing ever and anyone can do it. But actually, if you actually watch Nicole race, at the end of every race, Nicole pulls this amazing, disgusted looking face as if she smelled something absolutely rotten. And that is the face that Nicole has in every training session because she's working so hard. She may be <laughs> swimming less meters, but she's producing so much more lactate than everyone else that you just have to feel sorry for her. Nicole, <laughs> can you describe the pain and why that face comes on your, appears on your face at the end of it? Could I start? I promise I love swimming. <laughs> um, I don't even, like, to be honest, I don't realise I'm, like, it's not, like, a, a, a thing I do, like, as for my ritual of, like, my cake bath on the block before I race, whereas, like, the face at the end of the swim, it's not purposely, it's just, I think it's just because, like, you give, with, with racing, you give absolutely everything you've got. Um, so when you finish you don't have that much energy and I think just to give me that little bit more energy to finish the race <laughs> I have to pull that stunning face when I finish it's an automatic reflex for you now by this stage <laughs> <laughs> oh it's weird if I don't do it never mind if I do do it <laughs> so you just mentioned rituals um, what do you mean by your little kickback on the block when it comes to racing um, so ever since I think I just started swimming internationally. Uh, with the blocks, they have like a wedge where you dive off them. And before every single race, I put my wedge in place. But the way it kind of like clicks into place, I don't let it click into place. I don't click it into place. I get up on the block and then with my back foot, I kick it back into place to make sure the block's ready and I'm ready. And do you think oh, there's a loud bang that happens? So that's how you know that Nicole is racing because it will be really, really quiet and all you'll hear is a big bang. Um, <laughs> and have you ever had a race or a competition where you weren't able to do that? I've had a race where I didn't do it. Like I simply just, not forgot, but I just, for some reason I didn't do it and the race didn't go to plan. So ever since, ever since it didn't go my way that I didn't do it, I've done it ever since. So it's a little bit of a, uh, a oh God, if this doesn't happen, something bad is going to happen. 
<laughs> That's how so you know makes, I'll be ready in Tokyo. <laughs> it makes you feel good, exactly. So on race day, can you just give me a little bit of a walkthrough of what happens on race day? So in swimming, in the Paralympics, it goes heats and finals in the same day. So what happens when you wake up? I mean, people would just think, oh, you wake up, you go behind the block and you swim, but that's simply not it. Uh, so I like I like a lot of time before I race. So I get up. I'm not a big breakfast person, but I try to eat as much food as I can the morning of my race. And then I'd go to the pool like two and a half, three hours before my swim. Uh, I'd do a really nice, long, dry land. Then I'd get in the water for about 40 to 45 minutes to do my warm up. I'd do a few dives and then two of the coaches have the glorious job of putting skins on me. <laughs> so when you say two two staff members put um the skins on you, do you just like lie there on the floor? <laughs> <laughs> I have done that before. <laughs> uh, I don't lie, I'm not that lazy. I kind of I kind of just stand around and then sometimes I try help, but then me helping, they're just like, no one to go stop. We got it. <laughs> and um, that's just because it's it's so difficult to put on a racing suit. I don't think people understand how no. how tight and how small they have to be for them to work properly. Exactly. Uh, and then I'd put my racing suit on. I'd have a few jellies after my racing suit. And then I'd go to the car room 20 minutes before my race. And then I'd race. But then even when the race is finished, I'm not finished. Um, I'd get out. As for the competition, you have to do an interview. And then after the interview, I had to go back to our physiologist to get our lactate. And then I'd do a swim day. And then I'd be allowed home to go and sleep. And then I, if I made a final, I'd go back and do it all again. All again. And what happens in the call room? Like, what do you do? I know when I'm in the call room, I sit there and listen to music. Do you listen to music? Do you <laughs> talk to people? No, I think, yeah, I talk to people. I, I, I'm not one of them because I feel like if I was to listen to music, it just get me that bit more nervous that I didn't need. So I kind of just, I either go into my own little world if no one wants to talk to me, but if people do talk to me, I do talk back to them. It's a nice place in Nicole's own little world in her head. <laughs> it is. <laughs> where she goes. <laughs> she thinks happy thoughts. That's exactly it. And what else? Of course, you wouldn't be able to get here or do anything that you're doing at the moment without the support of your amazing parents. Can you please... Tell the listeners all about Bernie Turner. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I live at home with my mom, my dad, and my two older brothers. Uh, my two oh, older brothers that? in Port Arlington in County Leash. Um, my two older brothers, one of them's doing a college degree and the other one's doing an apprentice. And then my dad works a full-time job, so he's in work five days a week. Uh, my mom is a qualified nurse. But when I was after I was born, I was born a sick baby. So she just took time out because especially because me and my brothers were still really young. So she, she took time out to look after myself and my brothers when we were younger. But then I got into swimming. And swimming that committed sport that you have to give it everything or you give it nothing. And so then when I got back into swimming, my mom decided that she wasn't going to go back to work. And she was going to take me to and from the pool each day. At the start, it wasn't bad. Like it was only a local pool. Um, but now I swim, so I live in Port Arlington in County Leash and I swim in the NAC in Blanchardstown. So it takes us an hour and 10 minutes to get to the pool each day. Um, and even on days like a Saturday morning, so we'd be in the pool for seven o'clock on a Saturday morning. My mom would drop me to the pool and then she'd go to the back of the car park and set up a bed in the back of the car and sleep for two hours. So you heard it here first that your beautiful Toyota, that Toyota have, <laughs> have lended you for a while and um, it makes a great a great little sleeping area. I mean we're grateful for the car but we're also grateful for the extra bit of sleep as well. <laughs> <laughs> and what else what happens when you come out of the pool so I know when you finish exercising you try and get your nutrition in within 30 minutes of training so how do you make sure that you're able to recover before you're home in that air in 10 minutes I mean my mom's lovely and she does it's not so good ne- bad now as it's not as challenging now as it was before because now I'm obviously not in school um and plus we're swimming in the middle of the day but back when we were swimming with the NAC in the evenings um 
I'd come out of the pool at seven o'clock and I'd eat my dinner in a thermal food flask that my mom had cooked the dinner during the day. And then she'd put it in the flask and take us, take it with us to Dublin. And then my dinner would still be hot by the time I got out of the pool. So super Bernie, basically. Super, super, she's like super mommy. She, <laughs> <laughs> she's like the Chris Jenner of uh, para swimming. She ner- she's a momager. <laughs> she even like brings banana bread to training for um, all your other teammates, and of course Dave Malone, your coach, who adores them. Oh yeah, like that's the thing. Like even as I'm getting older, and people are like, oh, you're gonna start driving and driving yourself to training. Like I don't know what my mom's gonna do when I go back, to- but when I start driving and go swimming. <laughs> She's not gonna let you go. <laughs> no, she's not. Like that's the thing. Like my mom, my parents aren't pushy, and like I am nineteen, and I haven't passed my driving test yet. But she's not pushing me, and she says she's not pushing me because she wants. She wanted me to put, focus on Tokyo. But I think deep down, it's because well, for one, she doesn't want to lose the sponsored car, and for two, <laughs> she doesn't want to. She just yeah, I don't know. Cause she's a woman that she can't sit down either. So I don't know what she'll do. She'll obviously have to go and get some sort of job after when I go back, when I start driving. <laughs> well, if she wants to mind me, I will take Bernie. She'd happily, Ellen, she'd have like ask her to move in, in with her and she'll, move, she'll, she'll let you move in. I'm sure there's loads of people listening right now who are like, I love banana bread. I could do it with a Bernie. Um, <laughs> and you mentioned there that you're not in school. So you took a, a took a break from education. What are your plans after Tokyo? Are you going to go back as, as well as learning how to drive? What are your plans? I think like some people are like, oh, you're going to go back to school after. Like I left school. So basically I left school when I was 17 after transition year in 2019. Yeah. Um, and, and you thought it would only be a year I thought it was only going to be a year of my school uh, but then when the games got postponed like I prioritised them over school not going to lie education is very important but I wasn't going to stop swimming just so I could focus on that um, and then like people are like now are you going to go back to school but to be honest I'm 19 and if I to go back to school a bunch of 17 year olds I don't think it's my the top of my list so I think I'm going to go and do a PLC in college and then hopefully that'll lead me and plus it'll be something I'll be interested in rather than going to school six five days a week to do subjects I'm not sure what I want to do in. Do you know specifically what PLC you're going to do or where you want to go? Uh, I'm doing it in sport management I think and it's a college actually like 20 minutes away from my house so it works out well and it'll tie in well in as well. So obviously in Tokyo, there will be no spectators. Do you know anything about what Port Arlington they're going to do? <laughs> the people oh, on Port Arlington say that. have a great swimming history. <laughs> um, they do. And to be fair to Shane Ryan, he's he started the hype with the Olympics. Um, but even like now when I'm over here, my mom's sending me messages being like, oh, there's like posters over here. There's posters here. And I'm like... I can't see them. I'm not there. <laughs> um, but I think there will. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not at home to see what's going on. But I think the people of Port Arlington are very, very supportive of me. Like it's a very, it's a pretty small town, so I'm pretty well known in the town, and everyone's just so supportive. And even they've been waiting for this as long as I have, so they're all really excited to tune in and watch. That's so exciting. And do you get like noticed when you're out walking around? <laughs> yeah and like more like it doesn't bother me well it never did bother me but like when it first started I, I kind of looked at the person and I'm like who are you why are you talking to me whereas now I'm kind of like oh I appreciate you uh, like like sometimes there will be people that, that'll come up to me and be like oh hi Nicole how are you and I'm kind of like yeah I'm good thank you but I don't know who you are <laughs> you're just a little bit awkward you haven't fully mastered the oh hi <laughs> exactly. I haven't mastered the fakeness of pretending to know someone just yet. <laughs> You'll get there. Um, and do you find that since Rio and kind of the success you've had at European and World Championships that you've become a, a little bit of a role model to your community and perhaps the little people of Ireland? I know they're a very special and important part of your life. I think I have. Like even... It was very cute um, yesterday. So my brother's girlfriend at the minute, like, so they've, they've been going out about nearly a year now. And when they first started going out and she came to the house and like my brother was telling her all about me, she actually couldn't swim. Like she'd never been, 
she was never able to swim before. And uh, she got into swimming lessons and now like she can actually swim. And she texted me yesterday and she was at the pool. And um, she said there was a little disabled girl there. And uh, she started crying because she wasn't getting her swimming right. And then her mom turned to her and was like, it's okay, Nicole Turner went through this and look at her now. <laughs> oh my god so, to just like to think that I do like to think people look like I'm even going back to I I, I like I obviously have dwarfism and when I first found out I had dwarfism I looked up to Ellie Simmons at the Beige, Beijing Paralympics in 2008 um, and then I was competing against her in Rio so just I think the way I looked up to Ellie you know like people may be looking up to me it's it's a nice feeling yeah and that is the power of the Paralympics it is that kind of representation that we don't see in mainstream media unfortunately that hopefully will improve but it is an, a chance and an opportunity not just to educate people on disabilities but also for younger people to see what is possible and also for for parents do parents ever contact you saying asking for advice or even <laughs> saying thank you for doing you mm, oh yeah like the amount there there is like even not so much with COVID now, but like back years, like a few years ago, I would go to the odd school, like the local school and just give a little presentation. And like there would be parents messaging me being like, thank you so much, you've inspired me. Like, it's just, it's a really nice feeling to think that like people, people are looking up to me and like all the work I do put in, it, that is something that is nice that comes out of it. So it goes in, in your little like happy box for that when you're having <laughs> one of those awful <laughs> sessions that might be longer than 50 meters <laughs> you're thinking this isn't just for me this is for them exactly um and I wanted to ask you when it comes to Tokyo how excited are you to share a room with me I'm very excited I'm <laughs> we're currently in a little bubble so we're not able to share at the moment but when it comes to the village I think we are going to be Really? <laughs> no, to be fair, I'm very like as I said in earlier, I am a I am a person who I can't I don't I don't like living life on my own. <laughs> I always like to have someone there or someone to talk to. And uh, so you'll be sick of me by the end of the next three weeks, Ellen. I will not be sick of you. I don't think you'll be sick of me. I'll just be super, super hyper. Nicole, tell the listeners what exactly you will be competing in in Tokyo and the days that you'll be competing. I'm actually only competing in three events in Tokyo, which is a big surprise for me. Uh, so day one, I'm doing the 50 meter freestyle. Day four, I'm doing the 100 meter breaststroke. And then day six, I'm doing the 50 meter fly. Amazing. And I'm sure all that information will be up online for listeners to, to look up. Nicole Turner, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you, as always, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> and very best of luck in Tokyo. Uh, stay tuned to Off the Ball this month for more conversations in this series with thanks to Toyota and their hashtag Start Your Impossible campaign. <laughs>